is round 10 of the World Rapid Championships and we're going to have a look at a game between the two tournament leaders with 7 out of 9 with the white pieces it's Vladimir Fedoseev playing against Magnus Carlsen it's a big game a big clash of styles also because Fedoseev usually likes to take a lot of risk and of course we know that Magnus is a very all-round player but let's see how he's going to play against that aggressive playing style of the Russian player. So Fedoseev starts with 1d4 and we get to see after knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, the Nimzo Indian. And here Fedoseev played the move knight f3 and there are so many different ways of playing here uh, with black. You uh, normally are going to challenge the center with a move like a d5 or maybe c5 or you can also postpone the decision how to challenge it and instead Fianchetto, your um, queen's bishop. Many different ways of playing. Magnus wants to get an imbalance. So he does give up the bishop for the knight. Very interesting positional decision. After bishop takes, white has to take back with the pawn. And now the big question is, is the, are these pawns weak? Or is White's uh, bishop uh, pair going to be um, worth something? Let's have a look. d6, queen c2, and black goes queen e7. Subtle queen moves. White places the queen on c2 to control the e4 square, preparing to play e4 at the right moment. Whereas the black queen on e7 is always ready to strike back with the move uh, e5. White first played here this move, a4. Grabbing some space on the queen side, but this can also become an, uh, a serious weakening move. Let's see how that's going to work out in this game. Black played c5. So black is now trying to create sort of blocked structure. Let's see how that works out. White goes e4. Black is not interested in taking on d4. That helps white to improve its uh, pawn formation in the center, undoubling the pawn. So instead, black goes for the move e5. This is a very nice and typical strategy in a lot of Nimzo Indian openings. So why is this so important? Well, black has traded off its dark squared bishop, then placed its pawns on the dark square. So this bishop on um, c8 can be developed uh, freely to, um, to any square. But white is grabbing space with the move d5. So things are not that simple. Your uh, minor pieces on b8 and c8, they don't have access to all the available uh, squares. Knight bd7 was played, so here you see that uh, Magnus decides to bring out the knight first. Probably the knight is on its way to uh, b6, and white could still have decided here to play the move a5. I think that is a good move, just to prevent that knight from ever coming to b6. It was not played in the game, instead Another remarkable move by Fedoseev, but I think very typical for his playing style. Playing very ambi ambitiously on both sides of the board. Here with a move h4, grabbing space there as well. And saying that, okay, if all the pawns are coming forward, then black in the end may have some difficulties to activate its uh, forces. Well, I think very important move here is to play the move a5 to prevent white from ever playing it's uh, on pawn to, uh, to that square, but both sides are neglecting that aspect of, uh, of the game. Magnus played here h6, bishop e2, and now what is black going to do with his king? Is he really going to castle kingside here? Well, then white is probably ready to launch more pawns and try to play for a kingside attack. So Magnus comes up with an alternative plan, also typical for these block structures. Rather than castling kingside, he goes with its king into the other direction, king d8. Very nice and uh, typical idea for uh, for this uh, opening. After knight d2, white is trying to improve its knight. The king is well placed on uh, c7. It will be very difficult to uh, for white to make use of the fact that black hasn't castled. Still, white can still uh, play something like a5. That looks quite reasonable. But instead, Fedosev continues with the plan. Knight f1. So the knight is probably on its way to the f5 uh, square. So therefore g6 is played. And another plan is to come forward with the g-pawn. The bishop supports this pawn. So white is uh, grabbing uh, space on that side. But it's not clear what is it's really going to bring him in the near future. And now, finally, 
Black goes for a5. I think it's a very important move. So the knight wants to come to b6. And that's exactly what is happening next. And, well, I'm not sure about Fedoseyev's uh, play here. He played his move h5. Very ambitious move. But it does open up the king side. Pawn takes pawn. White recaptures. And now the knight comes to b6. And the knight is excellently placed here. So that it covers both the pawns on a4 and c4. Now you may think these pawns are still well protected. That's true. But at the same time, white's pieces are also prevented from becoming active. And especially that pawn on a4 will become uh, more vulnerable. White goes knight g3. But the bishop is also covering the f5 square. Bishop goes to d7, by the way. Still covering the square, but also hitting the pawn on a4. Queen b3. And now what should black do? Well, the g-file is open. So it could be very nice to try to improve your queen. Get a rook there. And try to shift the attention to that side of the board. I think queen f8 is a good move. But knight e8 was played. So the plan is to improve the knight to g7. And when the knight is on g7, you can get in this move f7, f5. That's a nice pawn break. Opening up more files on the king side. But it's probably not the uh, most uh, precise move. Well, first of all, we should never be concerned about a move like rook b1. If white is intending to create a threat against that knight on b6, black can just answer it with a rook a6. Rook is protecting the knight, and now the pawn on a4 is hanging. So here you see that the rook is not that well placed on, uh, on b1. What should white do? Move like bishop f1, going back with the bishop. It's a difficult move, especially with a shorter time control. But it does make a lot of sense to try to trade off the light squared bishops if... Bishop on d7 is no longer there. The knight may come in to, um, to f5. So this is a very good positional move. But Fedor save instead goes for the move bishop e3. And after knight g7, now it's white's turn to give up the right of uh, castling here with the move king d2. King is kind of safe in the center. Rooks are connected. But black strikes here with the move f5. Pawn takes, knight takes. And well... Um, if you do exchange the knights, then the rooks are connected. But I think this is a very complex position. Why? Well, a pawn on h6 is also vulnerable, which means that the rook cannot easily leave the h8 square. White can also try to get a rook over to the uh, to the g file. Anything can uh, can happen here. But knights were not exchanged, and instead rook a b1 was played, hitting the knight. But we know Magnus his response: rook a6. Knight takes f5, bishop takes f5 here. You see the rook is under threat. So the rook goes to b2. So white is staying on the b file. The knight cannot go away because then the pawn on b7 is hanging. But at the same time, the queen and rook, well, if they don't really generate new threats, then they are also out of play. And here Magnus seizes the initiative, swinging with his queen over to g7. Excellent move. So the queen can try to um, infiltrate on g2, for instance, at some point. Queen d1, the queen goes back. Rook g8. Here you see the queen also defends the pawn on, um, on, g on uh, h6. King c1. Sort of artificially uh, castling. And the queen goes to h7, keeping the pawn protected and creating some uh, space for the rook to, uh, to infiltrate. Rook a2. So the rook is back on the a-file to protect the pawn. Freeing the queen from its defensive uh, duty. But now the knight is improved. Rerouted to the king side. Knight d7. Rook goes back to b2. It's clear that Fedoseyev is struggling here to uh, come up with a, with a good plan. The knight is coming to, uh, to f6. So there are various ideas. Uh, you keep an eye on this pawn. You may come into e4. You may use the g4 square with a knight or a bishop. Knight is much better placed. But here, white. Could still have gone back with the queen to b3 and try to deflect black from what he wants to do on the other side of the board. But Fedor Seyev here made a very um, important technical mistake. He played the move rook g1. He's trying to fight for control over the g-file. But after swapping one pair of rooks, this rook on b2 is far away from the action. And with the move rook a8, black will... 
regain control over the uh, only open file. That's a very good idea. But look now, Fedoseev goes for f4. Challenging the pawn on e5. And here you got to be very careful. If you do take the pawn on f4, white is not even going to take back. But there's bishop takes c5. That's a brilliant idea. As thanks to the move f4, the diagonal for the queen has been opened as well. It's a bishop sacrifice. If you do take the bishop, it's queen takes. Check. And you have uh, huge problems here. If you try to hide with the king, it's queen d6. Check. And the knight is hanging. White is all of a sudden just winning. Of course, Magnus understands that with the move f4, White is intending to take on c5. So first things first, rook g8. Attacking the queen. Queen got a move. Queen went to h2. Putting pressure against the pawn on e5. Black closes the position with a move e4. Now, on one hand, it's a pity that your diagonal for the queen and bishop has been closed. But White's bishops, they're also looking awful. And this is a passed pawn. Can be useful... Um, at uh, some point. Rook b1 was played. You see that Fedoseev struggling to find a good plan. And now after more pieces are coming off the board. The pawn weakness on a4 has been highlighted again. Queen d7 hitting the pawn. Bishop d1. Protecting the pawn. Bishop g4. Simple chess. Magnus is trying to exchange that important uh, defender. If you do take on g4. It's knight takes g4 with an attack. On the queen, bishop, and now also the pawn on uh, a4. So that's not possible. Bishop, c2 was played, so the bishop stays on the board. Protects the pawn. But now queen f5, and we see another pawn weakness on h5. So very nice play by Magnus, making use of weaknesses on different sides of the board. And the pawn on h5 cannot be saved. King b2, bishop takes h5. Rook e1, rook goes back, so white's play on the queen side has just uh, totally backfired. b6, just a solid move, Magnus just overprotecting the pawn, who knows? I don't think it was really needed here, but he also shows that he is not in a rush. King b3 was played, and now nice move, rook g6, overprotecting the pawn on uh, h6, white. Wants to uh, take that pawn, of course, if the bishop goes away, but now it's protected. And Magnus' idea is to place the bishop on f3, following it up with a move like rook g2. But look what happened. Queen h1. This is very tricky move by Fedosev, by the way. Bishop f3 is met by queen takes f3. And the pawn on e4 is not a good defender. It's pinned. After taking the queen, the queen on f5 is hanging. So black shouldn't rush. And Magnus, of course, is uh, very well alert for these... Um, Little tactics. He goes for rook g3, improving the rook first. Queen goes to uh, h4, rook h3, attacking the queen. Queen goes back. And now step by step, you're improving your position. The bishop comes in. It's protected by the rook. Rook to g1. And now the knight comes into g4. Black is totally dominating the king side. After queen e1, it's h5. Big, uh, big pawn coming forward. Bishop c1 back, rook h2, queen g3, bishop e2. Everything nicely protected. The black pieces are supporting each other. And white is uh, stuck. Played here the move, rook to e1. But now, next tactic, bishop takes c4. Here you see the pawn on c4 turned out to be a huge weakness. Black takes it, king recaptures, and the bishop is taken. So now you're two pawns up. You gotta be careful after queen h4. There are ideas to enter with the queen. But king d7 stops all the threats. Bishop e3. Rook goes back to g2. Queen h1. Attacking the rook. Rook to g3. Attacking the bishop. Bishop to c1. And now knight f6. So simple chest by black. Protecting the pawn one more time. White was intending to take it. There's also queen takes d5 as a threat. Rook to d1. Rook d3 interfering on the d-file. Renewing the threat. White has to take. But now, uh, well, there are so many problems here. You have an h-pawn. You have mating uh, threats. Okay, queen is still defending, but white can barely uh, move. King b5 played. Queen takes d5. That's another pawn. Of course, black is uh, happy to see the um, exchange of queens uh, coming. Black... 
of course, uh, didn't really expect it. Queen h3 was played. Check. King c7. And now all of a sudden, the white king is also sort of caught in a mating net. c4. Not a good move, but all other moves were losing as well. Queen c6. Check. King has to go to a6. And now with a discovered pawn move. Check. White uh, resigned here because uh, the king cannot do much. If you do take on a5, it's queen b6 with checkmate. This turned out to be a crucial win for the outcome of the tournament because a few rounds later, Magnus Carlsen managed to win the World Rapid Championships for the fifth time in his career, making it 16 World Championship titles. Incredibly impressive and also the way he played throughout this event. Very nice, in control, not giving any chances to his opponents and, well, defeating a world-class top grandmaster like Vladimir Fedoseev in such a style. Very impressive. An absolute model game. How to play the Nimzo Indian or, in general, how to play positional chess with imbalances in pawn structure, knight versus bishop. I thought it was very instructive. Let me know what you think of this game. Please, subscribe to the channel and probably some more games will be covered from this very exciting event. Congratulations, Magnus Carlsen. Thanks for making this video with me.